Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts at The Real Science Exchange. Tonight, we're talking about how dairy cow behavior impacts the nutrition she gets, regardless of the ration formulation. We've all heard about cow sorting, but tonight we're going to look uh, more deeply into how all factors work together to determine what she's consuming. Joining us at the pub tonight is Dr. Trevor DeVries from the University of Guelph. Dr. DeVries, uh, you joined us for the Real Science Lecture Series back in June for a complete review of this subject, and we'll share the link to that uh, to the full webinar in the show notes. But this is the first time, I believe, uh, for you to be at the uh, Real Science Exchange. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh, pleasure to be here, and thanks for the invite. Uh, you're very welcome, and thanks for joining us. Uh, as is our tradition, tell us what's in your glass tonight as we start our conversation. Uh, so in my glass tonight is uh, an American whiskey. As a, as a good Canadian, I like my rye whiskey, and I mostly drink uh, Canadian rye whiskeys, but one of my favorites actually is a, a fairly common American rye whiskey, and that's a Frontier rye whiskey. Very good. Uh, are you in, in the habit of drinking any Molson? Uh we consume a little bit of Molson product. I think 20 years ago, 25 years ago, maybe a little bit more, but uh, not as much uh, in recent times. The only reason I ask, I had a Canadian live right across the street from me, and uh, that's all he drank. He even have a, had a dog named Molson. So that was uh, top of mind. Yeah, that, that's quite common, actually. There's, there's many dog in Canada named Molson. So. <laughs> Molson. Probably a few blues as well. Yeah. All right. Very well. <clears throat> um, would you mind uh, introducing the guest that you brought with you tonight? So our guest tonight is uh, Dr. Tom Taluki from uh, AMTS. And uh, Tom's interest in, in, in behavior, I think, uh, lies, uh, well, a lot to do with uh, the modeling of that and obviously including that in their nutritional model and um, uh, over the years has uh, incorporated various research that uh, people have done in that area, including work from our group, and thought it'd be a great addition to uh, today's uh, podcast to have him be here and discuss uh, uh, that topic. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome, Tom. Glad to have you here. Thank you very much, Guy. Thanks, Trevor. That was, that was very nice. A nice introduction. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was. Tom, would you mind telling us what's in your class tonight? And then tell us a little bit about your background and also your company, AMTS. I'm happy to do that. Well, I'm doing something a little different for what's in my glass. I've, uh, this, this is, uh, <clears throat> homemade moonshine. Um, <laughs> you're the first. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's called science in action when, when it, because it was great, you know, being a, a, a ruminant nutritionist and dealing with fermentation all the time and not traveling. Uh, I was like, well, this is something I've always wanted to try, so let's try it. Uh, and if I were to drink the rest of what's in this quart jar, it would be a very <laughs> interesting conversation. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I did uh, did all three of my degrees at Cornell, and I started working with the Cornell model back in 1990. Um, and the the whole I'm a requirements person, actually. Uh, a lot of the work that I did uh, over the years has been related to growth requirements, maintenance requirements, uh, and that this whole issue of, of how we model activity to, to really do some adjustments for the energy requirements uh, has always been something that's been uh, it's been a big interest of mine. I got dare to say it's close to a passion of mine dealing with requirements like this. Uh, and, and also, you know, just even from the consulting work that I've done with, with various farms and, and viewing, you know, looking at their facilities and looking at how cows move and, and just, I, I'm, I'm kind of the odd one. My, my happy place is actually standing in the middle of a group of cows or, or actually even better grabbing a chair and sitting in the feed bunk and watching cows eat. Mm. Uh, I think I can learn so much more from doing that than, than most other things on, on a farm. Um, so my company, yeah, uh, 2005, three of us spun out of Cornell 
uh, to form AMTS, uh, we left with uh, a license to the core biological model, uh, and we started commercializing uh, uh, ration formulation package. Uh, we started off with zero clients, zero money, and, and a hope and a dream. Uh, we now have clients, I think, in 46 countries, I think we're up to. Uh, feed anything from, well, we added sheep and goats, so anything from sheep and goats or, or grazing dairies or our cow calf all the way through 100,000 cow uh, herds in, in various spots around the world. Uh, prior to COVID, I spent about a third of the year out of the country uh, teaching people how to feed and, and manage cows and nutrition. So it's gotten to see a lot of things around the world. I'm, I'm really fortunate in that. Um, and along with that, you know, we've, we, we also believe heavily in, in providing some educational things. So several years ago, we started a webinar series as well that, that, uh, well, Trevor's been on it. Uh, we've, we've had, we've, we've reached a lot of people that way too. So these things, these educational type moments are, are really, really important for our industry. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, listen, thank you again for uh, joining us tonight and look forward to the conversation. Uh, my co-pilot tonight is Dr. Pete Morrow. Uh, Pete is a technical service manager in the Midwestern United States for Balchem. Pete, what's in your glass tonight? Well, Scott, I wish I was a little bit more interesting, but I've got to uh, take my kids uh, tonight and 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 do take them for a little drive. And uh, uh, so I'm drinking a virgin uh, vodka and lemonade or also known as a lemonade. Lemonade. All right. You could have got, at least put a little bit of iced tea in there, had an Arnold Palmer. Um, Trevor, I, I usually have a brown liquor like yourself, but tonight I'm kind of changing it up a little bit and I'm having an IPA. Uh, we were at the animal science meetings last, white, last week. My wife went with me while we were gone. My college age son had a party at the house. So this was left in the re refrigerator. I have no idea where it came from. I do see that it's from Philadelphia. I like IPA, so it's pretty tasty. So that's kind of the story behind uh, what I'm having tonight, uh, a Yards IPA. Trevor, to get us started, can you give us an idea of how you got started um, studying animal behavior and how long you've been doing it? Tonight's PubCast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit balchem.com to learn more. Yeah, no, that's a, it's kind of an interesting path. It wasn't something that I necessarily, yeah, envisioned myself doing coming out of my undergraduate. I, I grew up in Western Canada, British Columbia, went to school at uh, the University of British Columbia, like many young people who go into animal science. I wasn't exactly sure the thoughts of becoming a veterinarian were in my brain and um, got uh, introduced to research in my junior year. And, and I had a major professor in my final senior year of my undergraduate that, yeah, offered me a, a graduate position. And he was a ruminant nutritionist. And so I envisioned myself getting into graduate studies uh, doing that. So this was in uh, well, 21 years ago, um, at 2001, and uh, when I started my graduate studies there, and I really didn't know wh where that was going to take me. And, and through, yeah, a variety of events, I ended up, uh, so my first major professor uh, passed away, actually, in the first year of my program. And uh, it was very unfortunate, uh, but at the same time, um, uh, it it actually forced me into a couple of things. Number one, it forced me into teaching that year, which uh, I think paved a little bit of a way for an academic field for myself. And at the same time, I had to switch uh, advisors. And so I was already being co-advised by a, um, a Dr. Karen Boscherman, who is a research scientist here in Canada, uh, very well known in the area of ruminant nutrition and, and fiber digestion and as well as uh, you know, behavior of cows as well and eating behavior. And, and then um, I was kind of orphaned at the time and they gave me to another professor, Dr. Marina von Kaiserlink, who was coming in at the time uh, as a new professor. And 
uh, needed grad students and she had an interest in, in dairy cow behavior and welfare. And so I kind of amalgamated my interest in ruminant nutrition with the behavior side of things. And that took me through my PhD. And uh, following that, I did a little bit of a postdoc that started with University of Guelph 15 years ago. So in 2007. And uh, since that time, yeah, we've, we've built our, our research program around the behavior of dairy cows, uh, focusing mostly on eating behavior, but also other aspects of time budgets of cows and how uh, nutrition impacts that, but also housing and management and milking systems, et cetera, uh, all influence the behavior of cows and then how that then translates into yeah, physiological effects on those animals and downstream production and health effects. And so, yeah, I branched out into a variety of different areas and and um, and have worked kind of globally, so to speak, in in that realm. Excellent. So, well, let's uh, let's kind of dive into some of your key learnings over the years, right? I know during your uh, webinar you talked a lot about dry matter intake and it driving uh, milk production, generally speaking. And so, what are some uh, cow behaviors that drives a dry matter intake? Yeah, that, it, that's an interesting one because um, uh, one of the things that we know is like inherently intake and production are, are linked, right? And so production can uh, be driven by intake, but it can also pull intake as well. Um, and so generally when we're considering trying to optimize production, we're trying to optimize dry matter intake of cows and uh, and cows, if we want cows to eat more, and I always make that point, if we want cows to eat more, they, they, they have to change their behavior to do so. Like a cow can't just magically uh, consume more feed. That has to come along with some type of change in their eating behavior. So cow wants to eat more dry matter. She's got to either spend more time eating or eat faster or have more meals per day or have bigger meals or, uh, or, or larger meals, right? And so, um, some of our work has, yeah, focused in that uh, area as well, thinking about uh, how do we, or what what are the most important? And again, it's it's not a simple thing. Like uh, lots of studies, actually, there's some conflicting kind of evidence. So some would say, oh, cows have to have more meals per day. Some would say, no, cows have to have bigger meals. Um, I think in certain situations, those two play out. It, it often depends on the diet and the type of diet the cows are eating. Uh, some of our data would suggest that from a intake and probably rumen health and efficiency standpoint, it's probably most important to get cows to, yeah, have as many meals per day, not eat too fast, right? Maximize the amount of time that they can at the feed bunk so that they can maximize how much dry matter they consume. But at the same time, and, and that goes to some of the modeling type stuff is we also don't want cows spending too much time standing there and, and eating because if she's forced to spend too much time chewing her feed, uh, that can then potentially kind of trickle down into uh, have negative impacts on how much time she spends standing, right? And causes too much standing time in cows. And, uh, and that can have a trickle down effect in terms of their production and health as well. So Tom, why don't you give us some insights into uh, how do you model that? Well, I, I, I want to pick up on, on where Trevor went because that is that is, that is so true. And if we look at uh, some of the stuff that that uh, Britt Grant and, and Heather Dan have done at Minor, playing with uh, uh, PEUNDF or indigestible NDF and, par and particle size, and, and that chewing time, it, it's really it, it's how long it takes them to chew something for them to swallow it. So, so there's all these diet interactions that impact eating time that we're just starting to learn about. Uh, and, and that's the challenge when we go to model some of these things. We can look at, you know, if we look at the data that's in the literature now, there's, we can come up with some basic relationships, but it, there's a lot of these questions that are starting to pop up that are gonna have massive, that are gonna have some really big changes for us in terms of how we actually do model it. So we're limited by the data that we have available. Uh, and it could be, you know, and what's going to be real interesting is the next generation of the core biological model from Cornell actually goes dynamic. So there has to be a, a, a 
intake model associated with that uh, because it, it's going to more represent how the cow actually sees that feed that, that she's swallowing. Uh, so th this is going to become even more critical over the next several years. As you say, you're going to need some data. Is that data that you're going to need to get from from uh, laboratories, analysis, the, the, that kind of data? Yeah. Or? No, th th this is research data. So it, okay. it, we rely heavily on, on the type of work that Trevor does, um, Got it. that the Finer Institute does, so that we can build these relationships. And, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but like a lot of the Model 2 to date has focused on the activity of the cows and the impact that say eating time has on lying time and and lying duration and or standing time as an alternative uh but I, the other part of that is yeah do we actually have a good way of modeling not only those impacts on the standing and lying time of the cows but also just how eating time can play a role there and how things that influence eating time affect intake and not the other behavior of the cows so to speak no, we don't have that. You know, I, I remember uh, when I was still at Cornell and, and we, we actually made a version. Uh, I had come out of extension and, and Danny Fox, who, who was my major advisor, uh, we sat there listing all of these things that we knew impacted intake. Uh, things like feed monk height. You know, you look at all the old freestalls and in, in the Northeast from the 60s that have the uh, the elevated uh, feed bunk in the middle of the barn uh, or how rough how the concrete's all worn out and it's just all this stone that's that's there all this aggregate and the cows have to kind of uh, suck through stone to try and get feed uh, and some of the other management related things and we had, I forget how long the list was of everything that we had in there. At the end of the day, it all had to come out because there's absolutely no data for us to quantify any of it. And, and it's huge. Yeah, and I was going to say that, like, yeah, it, it, it amazes me. Like, again, we've been doing work in this area for like our group for 15 years. Some of this work goes back, right? Like, well, Rick, Rick Grant from the Minor Institute's been doing this for years before that, thinking of some of the work that Jack Albright did years back, right? And looking at this, you go back into the 70s, there's literature on this. And then, as you say, there's still lots of gaps in terms of uh, what, what we don't know, so to speak. I, I probably get an email every week or two from someone with a question related to feeding management or barn design. And um, I'd say, 75 to 80 percent of the time i'm giving them kind of a, a best guess type answer rather than basing it purely on empirical evidence that we have right because a lot of these things yeah we, we have good kind of field experience or or we have we can we can piece together things that probably make sense but we don't necessarily have uh the data that you were just describing to actually really be be conclusive about some of these some of these areas well and, and we can jump in let's jump in dump in the whole side of, of forage particle size on that mm -hmm. you know you look at for how many years now we've talked about making the length of cut on corn silage longer with shredlage and its impact on pendf on pendf of the diet has that limited our intake in a lot of cases and in some cases probably it has uh, I look at the feeding systems I deal with around the world. Hell, the number that, that are still feeding in, in tractor tires in, in dry lots in South America. The, the, the sorting, the, the wasted feed, I mean, and how it's presented and, and stocking rates and all these things. Like you said, Trevor, we have gut feel. We have, you know, there's a little bit of data that we can say we should do this, but to take that and really model that management, that feeding management, we don't have the data. Yeah, and I, I always kind of, uh, yeah, kind of, well, look at it kind of like we look at forage quality, right? Like forage quality is influenced by so many different things, but if you look at the percentage of variation of forage quality that's dictated by different things, like 
just time of harvest is like, I don't know, 60, 70%, right? And yeah. like forage varieties and right, all these kind of things just co- contribute that wee little bit. And I look at kind of diets for dairy cows the same way, where it's like we can do all these kind of little tweaks and we can add little bits of this and this to the diet. But at the end of the day, in terms of intake and what the cow actually receives and consumes and gets from that diet has very little to do in a lot of cases. I don't say all the cases, but in a lot of cases has very little to do with what that formulation actually is. Right. And, and that's, that's our challenge often in the industry. Right. And it takes, often it takes good. Yeah. Consulting nutritionists and advisors on farm for picking up on those things, right. And identifying bottlenecks uh, that, and might be limiting the yeah the effectiveness of those diets that we're putting putting in front of cows. I can formulate to the nearest milligram of zinc, but I'm relying on someone to go load a, a, a twenty thousand pound mixer with a payloader and hoping that they're within one percent. Yeah. Hell, how many farms even know how many cows are in a pen? Yeah. So what are some of the big things that we do know, right, and guidance that we can we can give uh, dairy producers and nutritionists relative to uh, ration composition, fiber length, uh, moisture, those kind of things to, to optimize dry matter intake? That's a that's a big question, too. Like, yeah, again, we have lots of knowledge in these things. I, I don't want to I don't want to downplay that either. Right. Um but but I think one of the points and just the to the point Tom was making too about fiber length, like we've got like oodles of studies on on fiber length and and then even right in the last five to ten years on on the digestibility of that fiber, both digestible and undigestible, right? And 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 the impact that it has. But the the application is is often the difficult part because it's often context specific. And, um, and so you can, you can, you can do a study where you show that, yeah, you change the UNDF of the corn silage or something, and it changes the behavior of the cows, but then you go into real life and, and there's probably some other intervening variable or, 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 or confound there that's going to impact what actually result we see from feeding that diet. Right. And so. I think that's that's our challenge there, right? In terms of adding some of those pieces into to our models, but yeah, like we have lots of good data on, on uh, in recent times too, particularly on the fiber side of things, in terms of the impact it has on sorting. Like uh, we're talking about trying to, yeah, in some cases, like Tom was mentioning, the shredage where we're trying to like maybe get a little bit of longer cut, right, and uh get a bit more uh different type of cut on the on on that corn silage but at the same time we see more sorting well what 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 happens in that case the the cows just don't end up eating that fiber so that's 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 a bit of the challenge there and we've come a long ways that way realizing that cows don't necessarily they need fiber and they need effective fiber but they don't need uh super long fiber right that's uh and and that's why most yeah, most people when they look at a diet now, if it's if it's longer than an inch or, or so, like the it basically those materials are just going to get sorted by cows and they're not going to get consumed as kind of predicted. And so, a lot of the kind of studies in the last couple of years or five years, I'd say, have really kind of pushed that, right? Well, and, and I think to go along with that, it would be. Some people might not like this answer, uh, but I, I and I'm not even going to apologize for it because it, it's reality. Too many times we make recommendations on forage quality or forage particle size or anything like that that are that are very generalized, and all of these recommendations really need to be site specific. You know what I make recommendations for in in for example to an Irish grazing herd uh, versus a California dairy uh, or a or a China Chinese dairy that's importing all their all their the majority of their forages they're going to be very different and 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 our our goals and our objectives will vary 
And, and I think that that's one thing that as an industry, we need to spend more time up. Here comes my extensive background. First thing I, I do when I go on a farm is basically try and figure out what is the mission, vision, goals of the farm and how are we going to meet that? Because then we can get into this whole forest discussion. We can get into the into allocation. Uh, there's so many ways that we, that we can handle these things, but we all have to start on the same page. Kind of change in direction just a little bit. I was kind of curious if there are uh, many animal differences in uh, determining dry matter intake, things like, um, uh, I'm thinking of breed, uh, age, uh, those kinds of things. What can you tell us about that, Trevor? Um, and that, yeah, and interestingly, again, that's, I think, uh, like, so the breed one is one where we have very little, uh, yeah, I guess, knowledge, so to speak, right, in terms of differences. We, you go on a farm, uh, a Jersey farm, for example, and the cows react differently. They, they you see them at the bunk, they eat differently. Um, uh, but if you look in the literature, there's no quantification of that. Uh, and uh, we don't really have any, yeah, clear kind of insight into, again, they're gonna have different requirements. And so our models will tell us that they have uh, different intake requirements. Uh, and, and Tom can probably maybe speak a bit more to that, but, uh, but on the behavior side of things, I don't think we really have uh, any kind of clear data to, to tell us, um, yeah, what impact that might have. Like, we see a lot more oral activity with, with jerseys. You ever walk onto a jersey farm, you see them all tongue rolling. And, mm -hmm. right? And, and again, that in, in, a, in a whole scene, if you see that, it typically means that those animals have been feed restricted at some point and, and, and that's induced that behavior where uh, it's, it's, a, it's a behavior that gets kind of um, elicited by that, that type of feed restriction. But in a, in a jersey, you just in, almost innately see it. And so, again, we don't even know why that might be the case. And uh, do they have a higher uh, kind of so-called foraging requirement, right? And, and that could be the case, but, but we don't necessarily have the data to, uh, to, to, to back that up. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let me add to that. Uh, if we look at all the intake equations, except for the new ones that Nason did that Mike Allen pulled together that include some things related to, to fiber, they're basically body weight and fat corrected milk. And it's, it's weighted about equal for lactating cows. And the biggest challenge that we have, and, and this is a challenge I'm going to throw to, I don't care if you're a nutritionist, an academic, a dairy producer, how much do our cows weigh? So I'll tell you what, our cows have grown tremendously. Cornell went back and looked at mature weight of the Cornell herd from 96, 93, 96 versus 2016. And the mature weight on that on that herd has basically increased one percent a year. So, anyone that's still guessing that 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 mature whole scenes are going to be, you know, six hundred kilos, thirteen, thirteen fifty, we're way wrong. We're talking the number of of eighteen hundred plus pound mature cows I see everywhere in the world that are Holsteins is shocking. And when we take that into account and why we see these really high intakes or like that, it's, it explains a lot of the variability we see. Get body weights, folks. It's not only that, not only does it impact this whole intake issue, but let's start talking about barn design. The number of barns I still seeing built with 48 inch stalls is criminal. And, and the lenders need to be educated on this. Uh, because suddenly if I say I want 52 inch stalls, I got to build a bigger barn and they don't want to pay for it. We have, we have lots of challenges on this. Mm. You know, speaking of challenges, Pete, you've been a practicing veterinarian for, for several years prior to going into industry. Uh, I, I'd be curious uh, to understand uh, your perspective on what, what kinds of challenges relative to this have you seen on dairy farm or some of the big well, ones? No 
Thanks, Scott. There's no question. There's a, a lot of challenges and in, in going back to the, the, the stall design for those larger cows. Um, you know, we have cow comfort issues that can in that can really impair intakes. We can have bunk space issues, whether it in terms of just adequate bunk space or, um, you know, the way the bunk is designed so these cows can get at feed. Um, one thing that I notice as much as anything is just variability in the management skills and or goals on the on the dairy, whether it be accuracy of feeding or um, frequency of push-ups and you know, whether that can be con done consistency, consistently, excuse me, or if there's protocol drift. So I think there's a lot of things like that from a farm perspective that can be, you know, a, 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 you know, a really a big deal. Mm -hmm. I was going to follow up, uh, you know, we talked about uh, particle length earlier. How often do we think that we should be testing particle length? I know a lot of nutritionists, you know, are out and shaking out rations, uh, but is that something that should be done weekly, monthly, or is it once we kind of get where we get our feel, um, we feel a little comfortable with longer intervals between testing particle length? You're not going to talk about that. that. All right, I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> so what is our objective? Is my is my first question to that. If our objective is how are we going to put it put a diet together, then I do particle size determination on forages around harvest while they're chopping. And if I need to make adjustments while they're chopping, we'll make the adjustments. If we're doing it of the TMR, that's a different objective. That is a feeding management decision, uh, feeding management analysis. And it gets into, do they have dry matters right? Are the knife, if it's a vertical mixer, are the knives uh, sharp? Are the kicker plates kicked in? Uh, did they load the mix correctly and like that? I, and I, I've been on farms, I've some of these really large dairies where they are doing shaker box every day on 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 a, on a load and i ask what are you using how are you using that data they don't have an answer we're doing it because they someone said it was a good idea if we're going to do it in relation to a mixer analysis awesome and that could be i don't care do it monthly do it quarterly how what's the management of, of the overall system uh I, do, I only will do it if I'm conducting uh, a TMR, if I'm doing a TMR on it. And between times on that, well, I'm hoping the feeder's doing their job. If I have a question about it, yeah, I may go screen it. I may do whatever. But it, it's we have to have these conversations with the feeder, the management, make sure that we have buy-in and that they understand the importance of what they're doing. And they should have the power, the, man, the feeders, should have the power to come back and say, you know what, I think that we have something wrong here. We need to put new nugs in the mixer or we need to do something. Uh, it, it's uh, collecting the data other than that is just data, data collection with, with no clear objective. You know, talking about data, uh, I just want to pivot a little bit. What are your guys' thoughts about uh, the rumination monitors that are available? Is that um, obviously it's used for herd management. Is there possibilities around research or could we titrate um, some of our management practices, whether it be feed times, uh, push up times uh, around some of this data that uh, comes from the uh, rumination monitoring systems? No, I, uh, happy to jump in on that. I, again, I, I, we've been using those systems extensively, both in our controlled kind of studies that we do at our research station, but also in field trials um those systems again were developed primarily as well it, the original thought actually came out of uh having activity monitoring was primarily for reproductive management and and still is and 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 plays a significant role there and i think we're we're starting to see more and more uptake especially as the systems get better we see more and more uptake on the repro side of things some big farms even able to achieve uh very similar reproductive numbers with uh, activity systems as 
uh, with with shot programs. And so um, there's there's some really pluses on that side. But then, yeah, the the idea of using that data for health management that was kind of the next big thing in terms of using it for identifying cow level uh, health uh, events and deviations, picking up cows early. We've we've been part of kind of contributing some of that data to that uh, realm and um, helping us, yeah, uh, particularly in our transition cows, find those cows early, uh, replacing again, fresh cow monitoring programs on, on many farms. Uh, but then beyond that, I think what you kind of alluded to there too, we, we have opportunity with some of this data in terms of herd level management. So, right, looking for deviations, again, comparing numbers from herd to herd is, is quite difficult in a lot of cases, but within herd, looking at deviations over time uh, as it relates to, say, feed change, as it relates to pen dynamic changes, stocking density changes, temperature changes, right, seasonal changes, all these kind of things. And that's probably been the least explored, but probably potentially one of the most valuable um, uses of those systems. And and again, it just the things like you mentioned rumination, that's one aspect, but a lot of the systems we uh, that are out there now are, are providing more than that too, right? So not just the chewing time of the cows, but time at the bunk, if we can get other measures of activity, even standing line behavior, location of cows, putting all that together, uh, we can complete or complete a much better picture of the behavior of that animal and, and use that data. And I think that's kind of the future from those that monitoring standpoint and whether that's through wearable devices, whether that's uh, computer vision type uh, systems that can track animals and other management events in, in barn. Uh, I see a uh, huge kind of opportunity there. Uh, the technology is there. It's, it's just a matter of refinement and, and making it work on farm. I think yeah. the potential with the artificial intelligence and our machine learning to use maybe multiple data points, uh, I could foresee a, you know, a rumination monitor being a real internal control or a you know a, a very effective uh, at looking at data points for you know day by day management to ensure um, you know protocols are being followed and whatnot. Yeah, some of the problems with that we that we have right now though is the different systems do things slightly differently. So, so we can't, so if we're going to make recommendations, we've, we've got to be making recommendations within a brand. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't, we don't know much about that yet. Uh, that this is, we're generating so much raw data and, and, and we don't know how to use it yet. Yeah. So that, that'll yeah, come, that'll come. It's exciting. It's really exciting, actually. Yeah. And that's, we have that's your rules of thumb. I'm just kind of curious, right? There's 24 hours in a day. Do, do we have enough data to know, you know, what percent of the time ought to be spent feeding, what percent ruminate, ruminating, what percent sleeping, all those things? Do we do we have guardrails? I think we do with some of that, but it but it depends. Okay, so if we look at the studies that have been done, okay, so if we look at the minor data, what are we talking? 10, 12 hours of resting time, okay. Uh, but if we start looking at the data coming from the, these uh, automated systems, again, it, it's kind of brand specific as to how they determine some of these. And, you know, if we were to, so I don't know enough of the differences between brands to be able to say brand X, brand Y, brand Z, um, that needs to happen. Yeah. yeah, and and some of that's but even within brand, right? You'll have a, a system that you have on one farm, and let's say it's monitoring, monitoring rumination time, and it's telling us that the cows are ruminating for 500 minutes per day, right? Farm next door might be doing almost anything identically, and if their diets are very similar, and their cows are mon ruminating for 550 minutes per day. Really you'll see some of that, right? And and again, 
you don't know what's driving those differences, right? So the technology is consistent in itself, but when you put it, and, and that's a good thing, right? Uh, but then when you go on farm, because of so, like even these small differences in management or right diet that we might not even be able to detect, you'll see those kind of differences. And so often when we look at the data, we have to, again, look at it within herd and we have to be looking at kind of if we're looking at a cow level looking at deviations from their herd mates uh again within similar kind of days and milk parity etc and then if we're looking at a herd level again you're looking at over time how things might change it it, it can be very difficult to say well this this herd's rumination time is too low or something like that it, it might not actually be right for that specific herd and so that becomes some of the challenge there in terms of having kind of just general numbers that we can put, uh, so to speak. And and as Tom mentioned too, right? They, the, the one of the big challenges is the fact that we do have, yeah, various systems out there, and they all measure a little bit different. They have different mathematical models or algorithms that are predicting the right the the behavior. Again, whether that's from a sensor that the cow is wearing or a video or or what it might be. Again, competition is always good, but at the same time, it does it does result in in variability in terms of different uh, systems that producers have available to them, and 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 not as much probably consistency between systems as we we would. Uh, so people like myself, researchers, consultants, advisors who are looking at the data sometimes. And what's worse is all of those systems are proprietary. So we don't know what those algorithms are. And that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Tom, you're a technology guy. We've been talking a little bit about technology here. If you're looking into the future, let's say 20 years, and you're able to design a, um, a facility to optimize, uh, you know, feeding time, rumination time, and then be able to measure that, what, what does that facility look like? What kind of technology is going to be employed? knowing some of the things that we're working on. The use of AI and neural networking is going to grow exponentially. Uh, and we will get this center thing, these differences in companies and like that figured out. It, it's really it's really exciting because in, and it's starting to be driven pretty fast now with, with and this is a global issue, labor availability, uh, the, the amount of, of Technology, the, the level of technology adoption is growing quickly. We're starting to see where some groups are actually starting to, to are willing to communicate with other groups to be able to start to do some of this. Um, you know, I, I, I've been involved, I, I've, and they're one of our clients, really large dairy in Chile that is all robotic now. And some of the challenges that they've had, some of the opportunities that they've had with, with all of this data is massive, but what it's done to their labor efficiency is unbelievable. Mm. You know, when we start talking one person per 500 cows versus one person per 100 cows, we're talking real progress here. And we're gonna see more of that as labor challenges continue. Mm. Yeah, was, yeah, go ahead, Trevor. Oh yeah, no, I, I was gonna add, I think that's like, we're, we're already seeing that, well, we are seeing that that'll continue to go. Just I was having a conversation last night with someone too who sells automated feeding uh, systems, and and they're uh, they're taking calls left, right, and center right now. So they they sell robots for milking, and and again that market in Canada has exploded. It continues to to grow. We're starting to see that in the U.S. very strong, uh, both small farms as well as large farms moving towards that, and and. Again, feeding off some of our research, again, going back to the comment earlier about consistency and making sure we're getting accuracy and precision in our feeding, some of that or, or the lack thereof is because we have humans involved. And, and so the more we can automate that, the, the, we take that human variability out and we see, we see better outcomes. And, and, and well, from my perspective, I'd like to see that driving the reason why we do it. But at this current time, it's actually the labor availability that's actually driving some of this forward. And we're seeing more and more interest in 
terms of automated mixing systems, automated feed delivery systems. Uh, companies are trying to scale those up for large farms uh, currently as well. Again, a lot of them were developed more for small uh, farm kind of uh, situations, but we're starting to see more interest on, on large scale operations in, in terms of that. And, and the beauty is that you, when we, when technology is developed properly and, and implemented properly, you see both that benefit, right? In terms of the consistency of application. And so that trickles right down to the diet and, and, and the eating behavior then and the behavior of the cows, but then also the labor side of that is, is huge in terms of what savings there, there could be. So how do, how do, uh, sorry, Tom, I was just going to ask real quick, um, uh, how does robotic feeders um, um, change feeding behaviors, right? We're no longer having a TMR. We're getting grain uh, in, the, in the milking machine. We're getting a PMR instead of a TMR. Has there been a lot of research on that? And how does that change the dynamics, rumen health, all those things? Yeah, I, again, I, I can talk on that. We, we just did a there's there's opportunities and challenges there. I, I guess there's there's two things there, right? So as we move to robots uh, for milking, uh, it does change the way we feed cows to some degree. Um, and so, and we do have also opportunities within TMR systems to automate that too. So that's that's a different subject altogether. But on the robot side, like we just did a symposium uh, at the ADSA meeting last week uh, on kind of challenges and opportunities with robotic milking in, in terms of nutritional management. And uh, one of the things that comes out of that or, or came clear is that, yeah, we, we do have opportunities, but we also have, there, there's challenges there. And one of the challenges, and it kind of relates to this discussion, and, and I highlighted that in the presentation I gave, was that we're also dealing with uh, the behavior of the cows, right? So right. we can say we want this cow to visit that robot so many times per day and and in that robot she's going to get feed that's maybe tailored to her needs in terms of amount and even composition but then if the cow doesn't go she doesn't get it so we need to think about the other factors that influence the behavior of the cows the behavior individuality of the cows not every cow is the same right just we know that and so uh we're still scratching the surface and a lot of uh that uh, as well in terms of uh, trying to figure that out and again I, we have opportunities but i think uh, more work needs to be done and the industry is going to yeah benefit from that as as we move forward mm -hmm. do you see great potential for maybe increasing longevity of cows or productive life just because of uh maybe more room uh, stable room and ph levels or um uh, just a improved uh production and or reproduction based on the ability to just this tighter management where we can really manage, you know, a much higher level. Um, I don't know, Tom, you want to, <laughs> you, you want to jump in on a few things? Hot potato. All right. Longevity. Let, let me begin by this because there are people who will argue this with me till the cows come home. Huh? Um, but if we go through the literature, the most profitable number uh, of lactations for a cow is in her fourth lactation. Second most profitable, depending on depreciation levels, is either the fifth or the third. Huh. So the question is, where do we fail? What are all the insults? And, and I think as, as this is where technology can help us actually. As we start looking at how we feed cows better, how we house cows better, cool cows better, whatever metric we want, anything we can do to improve longevity is going to improve the overall profitability of the business. And, and that's what we should be thinking about instead of just purely cash flow. Uh, so, but that also comes with this caveat of, and, and this is where I think a lot of people have a misunderstanding. Uh, when I do trainings and like that, I don't anywhere. I have a slide that that I use that I call cows the Uber athlete because if you calculate the energy requirements or what that you know that cow is 
metabolizing per pound of body weight, and we compare that to any of us sitting here, it is shocking. Okay, we are, we're about 25 kcals per kilo of body weight. If we take a marathon runner while they're running, they're probably around 40. If we look at a professional soccer player, football player, depending on where we are in the world, they put data loggers on those guys. And while they are out there on the field, they're metabolizing about 60 kcals per kilo of body weight. And they are considered national heroes and are treated like, oh my God, we'll do anything for you. And then they take three weeks off. <laughs> we take a cow given 35, 40 kilos of milk. They're metabolizing 100 K cows per kilo of body weight. So four times per kilo of body weight, what we do. And we expect them to do that every day. Okay, so and in a full leather coat. Hmm. It's how we house them, how we manage them, how we feed them. All of these things that we talk about with, with intake, animal welfare. Folks, we have to understand these things. There isn't an athlete in the world that even comes close to what our cows do every day. We have to treat them that way. They're amazing animals. And we can improve longevity, we can improve profitability, we can do many, many things if we keep that in mind. Trevor, maybe a two-pronged question here, but uh, it's obvious, you know, during our discussions here, there's, there's, we're really, at the beginning of some of this research, right? There's a lot yet to know. Technology's changing, which is going to change the direction of our research. As you look forward, as you look into your career, um, what is it you're looking to pursue in terms of uh, the, the next research? Or, or if you'd rather, you know, what is the research that you think needs to be done, whether you're going to do it or not? Um, can you give us some insight into that? With or without yeah. budget constraints. With or without budget constraints. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> If money's not an issue. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think it comes back to um, keeping up, actually. So that's some of our challenge right now is keeping up with some of these technology developments and making sure that, yeah, we 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 match our, our the, the data to to that in terms of um, some of the hesitation in terms of technology adoption comes with, yeah, the unknown, right? In terms of what benefits does it provide, and and how do we how do we maximize the use of that, right? So that we are um, doing these things, which, which Tom just mentioned, right? In terms of maximizing the comfort of the cows and and management and welfare of the animals, so that we get the longevity of the animal and we we get the most profitability well the technologies can do that but we, we still don't know in a lot of cases how best to do to kind of achieve that through those technologies and so and and, and whether or not we can be uh more precise on an individual animal basis i think that's kind of a that's one of the areas that we've been working in more recently right like again we've got these big herds of cows and and, and we we for practical reasons, we treat them all the same, mm. but they're not all the same. Even, even, even in a group of cows that are similar stage of lactation, similar parity, similar dry matter intake, you see variable responses from those animals. And similar and genetic the question is, yeah, yeah, the genetics are streamlined like crazy, but we still see variable responses between animals. And so explaining some of that variability, whether that's the behavior of the animals, whether that's physiological variation between animals, uh, and 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 then can we use technology? And I think that's where I get really excited: is can we use technology to meet the individual's need? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, and and again, if you're milking forty cows in a tie stall, right? You have a pretty intimate knowledge of all those cows and their individual needs. If you're milking a thousand cows or ten thousand cows in a free stall. 
uh, can we use technology to do the same thing basically, right? And 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 basically make sure that every individual's kind of needs are met, whether those are behavioral needs, whether those are right physiological needs, and 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 they might all be different, right? And so that's that's what makes dairy different than other production animals. It goes back to right, like even though the genetics are similar, it's not the same as say like you've got a broiler barn with ten thousand or twenty thousand birds, and you can basically expect identical results. You have two broiler barns next door to each other. You're going to have identical results. Goes back to what I was saying before. You got two dairy barns that are next door to each other, even with very similar genetics, same diets, same housing systems, a little bit of management difference. You're going to get end up with two totally different outcomes in those farms. And so some of our challenge is trying to figure some of that out too, right? As we yeah, in, in all things, we, we we become more cognizant of efficiency, labor efficiency, nutrient efficiency, environmental impacts of farms, right? All these things, it comes back to at a herd level, but even more so down to that cow level, trying to maximize kind of the, yeah, I guess you could say the efficiency of that animal, right? So I think that's 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 what kind of excites me. And I think that's, those are the the areas that we're going to continue to push in towards. Let, let me jump in there. Uh, really, I'm a, I'm a systems person. I look at a farm as a series of, of boxes and try and figure out how they all work together. Part of my PhD, one of the things I did was I collected the daily milk weights from a group of high cows on a very well managed, at the time, 600 cow dairy for six months and ran all that data through. I did uh, variance components analysis. I gave the data to Bob Everett. He ran it through the test day model. And here's the scary thing. One standard deviation on residual milk. So after we take into account genetics, environment, all these things, one standard, standard deviation was over four kilos of milk. Okay, and that's normal. And, and if we look at the day-to-day -day variability in the in these cows as to where they are on milk, statistically, it's it's low probability it'll happen, but it is statistically possible where every cow decided in this group there were going to be minus three standard deviations on milk. How would you like to be that nutritionist who got the phone call that the whole flipping herd dropped twelve kilos today? What the hell did you do? And it's normal. It's how do we understand that? How do we manage that? That gets really exciting. And that's where this technology, where all these technology things can really come in to help us understand more of that. It's really, from a tech junkie, it's really exciting time to be in this industry. Well, you can become, you know, instead of average, you know, managing around an average, if you're just looking at daily milk intake, suddenly we're managing the variance. And that's really where the quality comes in, right? Absolutely. But at the same time, at the same time, at the same time, as, as our, you know, genetic uh, ability increases and our, and our average daily averages go up, it actually naturally wants to increase the variance. So that's the real, the real fight, right? I don't know about that so much as I, I, I had a lot of discussions about this with Bob Everett. Um, people that didn't know Bob Everett, who don't know who Bob Everett is, he was an animal breeder at Cornell. And he, so the, like the Northeast sire summaries that were published uh, twice a year it, were calculated by Bob. And, and he was an amazing statistician. Uh, and I would love to have several conversations with him now. Unfortunately, he passed away, I forget how many years ago now, from lung cancer. And um, threw some very challenging ideas out there. And there's these levels of variance. Ah, here's where I was going with that. As a great example, herd I've worked with since 97, I, I have a chart of daily milk production shipped per cow per day 
since January 1st, 2000. And I can show you all the management changes that were made during, during that time. And actually, as we improve management, as we address some of the underlying issues, the variance goes down. And, and I can clearly show that. So it's really, we need to, we need to do variance component analysis on these farms, determine where the greatest variable aspect is, address that, and then move on to the next one. It's this, it's this whole concept of continuous improvement. We can make huge progress. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, we're, uh, getting close to the end of our time here. I want to make sure that there's no uh, big topics that we've uh, left uncovered that we need to need to talk about. Hit most of the treetops, did we, Trevor? I think so, yeah. All right, very well. I'll say moonshine's great. <laughs> it's not gone yet, which... Yeah, I was, was going to say, you haven't, you haven't finished that yet. No. I, water, I, I, I diluted it down with, with, with uh, seltzer water, so... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I want. I don't want to know how much I drink. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we're going to call last call, and uh, would like to uh, have each of you, uh, the three of you, to kind of give us, you know, one, two, three key takeaways for the practicing nutritionist, veterinarian, or even dairy producer out there that they can take away from our conversation today and and, and actually put it into practice. Tonight's last call question is brought to you by NitroSure Precision Release Nitrogen. NitroSure delivers a complete TMR for the rumen microbiome, helping you feed the microbes that feed your cows. To learn more about maximizing microbial protein output while reducing your carbon footprint, visit balcom.com slash NitroSure. And uh, Peter, I'm going to start with you, dude. Well, thank you. I, I think as if you took my key takeaway would be that really uh, the day-to-day -day management makes a huge difference. Uh, stocking density, bunk space, cow comfort, lying times, and the ability to do that and give these cows what they need on a consistent basis is probably the, the most difficult thing to achieve on dairies. And But we need to strive for it every day. And I think that that's where we can have the greatest impact on, on longevity, on production, on health. And I, I think our industry needs that because, you know, we're in an ever, um, you know, shrinking profitability world in terms of less margin per cow. But we also need it from the, the standpoint of our consumers demanding that our cows live longer and that they're housed better. And uh, I think that it is a real a pop, you know, opportunity for the industry to do better and, and have uh, these cows get in more, many, many more cows uh, in herds reach their fourth and fifth lactations and uh, be healthy the entire time. So I guess I'm, I'm very optimistic about what the future holds for the dairy industry and its potential to really achieve these, uh, you know, greater production at the same time as with achieving greater longevity. Yeah, thank you for that, Peter. Tom, what final thoughts do you have for the audience? If I could have everyone get some body weight on cows, because that allows us to do formulation better. I don't care what formulation system that we talk about, body weight is the single most important input. And it, not only from a formulation standpoint, but from a veterinary standpoint, how do we give drugs? milligrams per kilo of body weight. Uh, if you don't know body weight, you're either gonna be under treating or over treating. Come on, this is either we build resistance or we waste money. Other than that, technology's exciting. There's, we're gonna see some really cool things. Regardless of all that, people, go watch your cows. Cows don't lie. Read your cows, they'll guide you down the right direction. Well said. Dr. DeVries, final thoughts from you. Yeah, and I concur with uh, yeah both the other guests here uh, and, and their final thoughts. And just to add to Tom's there too, like the body weight and then actually tracking the dry matter intake, uh, right? Uh, again, a lot of farms do it. A lot of farms don't do it. And the ones even that say they do it, are they actually tracking true dry matter intake by measuring refusals daily, correcting their dry matter intakes for these 
Because again, we can hone in our diets a lot better if we actually have true estimates of dry matter intake. And again, we can model that if we have body weights and we can do a better job in terms of our models that way, but we can refine those models too if we actually know what those cows are consuming. And I think we can work towards efficiency that way. And I think, yeah, just overall, my, my take home it, it is always, and, and again, just the, the behavior of the cows, uh, the eating behavior specifically is probably just as important as the diet itself. And, and that's going to be influenced by all these kind of external things, including the diet itself, but management, housing, environment, and, and to pay attention to that, like Tom said, watch the cows, what they do. We have exciting technologies that are going to help us do that now. And, and we're going to see more of that coming into the industry. And I think that's, that's uh, hugely exciting. And then, and then automation of management is playing a key role in terms of kind of feeding into that as well. And I, again, that's, that's for me, that's the future is, is trying to improve that and, and, and see more of that come into the industry. Cause I think with more of that, we're going to see continuous improvement and we're going to see, yeah, some of those things that, that were mentioned earlier in terms of, yeah, getting better health, welfare, longevity out of cows uh, moving forward. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Gentlemen, thank you for a lively discussion tonight, for sharing your insights uh, into the future. We're excited to see how the cow and the way we feed her are adapting to the industry uh, and making her more efficient and to positively impact the environment and our ability to meet the planet's growing food needs. Um, as always, a big thank you to our uh, loyal listeners. We hope you uh, learned something. We hope you had some fun. We hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions, and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.